That's all good. We'll just do it on, on this side. Oh. I'll describe what the screen looks like. Uh, that would be a great like final project presentation. Uh, I'll I'll just describe our project. Imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean that that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> um. What's the vibe, man? I decided to try something new today. I went for the full wine. Yeah. Huh? Don't say that. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> oh. Uh. Yo, yo, what's up? It's uh, time for another DJ Nemo lecture. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's see if uh, if uh, Victoria, uh, I'm 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 dumb. Sorry. Yeah, Victoria. It's Victoria, isn't it? Yeah, it's Victoria. No, I just sent it on the wrong. Wait, who did I send this thing to then? I sent it to Victoria. Yeah. Uh, if Victoria could let me know if uh, you know audio is going through and video and stuff, then, uh, then we'll get going. Oh, Terrence! Oh, yo, yo, yo! Nice. All right. Um, every morning, really, every every time I lecture, I wonder like, is this the time that I'll just randomly suffer from crippling, like, stage fright? Uh, <laughs> Oh my god, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, one day, one day. You know, here's, um, here's a, a, a fun fact. If, uh, if any of you ever, you know, struggle with public speaking, um, hot tip to get really good at public speaking. Uh, just do it a thousand times. <laughs> just do it a whole lot. Um, yeah, yeah, that's really it. Um, so welcome. It is planning your midterm time. Oh man, what? Y'all about to embark on some life-changing adventure? Oh man, I think you I think you just might be. Look around you. Look around you at each other. Look at that. One of you won't be here. Uh no, no. In uh in one week. Nah. You'll be great. Um You're going into this uh this section of the boot camp, you know, fresh faced young kind of greenfield developers you've never never written a line of real code in your life um, you're gonna come out of this uh, this week with straight up like traps you're, like up to here some of you're gonna have lats from just all the typing and stuff um, seriously y'all are you, gonna be grizzled um, some of you will have beards to show that time has passed at the end of the uh, the midterm. This is this is going to be legit. This going to be fun, um, and I'm going to take you through um, Lighthouse's patented top tips to plan out your midterm and to succeed in this section of the boot camp and to succeed at life um, to an extent. Right? So you know, don't take this presentation lightly. Um, are there any questions before we get started? There are 67 slides. What? 67 slides, oh man. So we'll, we'll get through roughly 30 of them in the first half, and then roughly 30 of them in the second half, um, math. So are, are there, what's that? Yeah, you, well, you will be, yeah. Uh, boop. There you go. Step one, step one for uh, succeeding at your midterm, pick a project, already a lie. I've already I've already thrown a little bit of a curveball in here. Pick a project. What? No. Nima's first hot tip: pick multiple projects. Right? Pick like two. Right? Maybe pick three, and discuss them as a group. Right? Discuss them. Weigh the pros and cons, especially for these first couple steps that I'm going to take you through. They're not very expensive steps. 
right? First of all, they don't cost anything except your time, which what's that worth anyways? And then, um, but it'll have some pretty, I, I, I think some pretty important kind of ramifications if you do your due diligence in exploring what working on different projects is going to be like, right? Uh, you might start off and say, oh, the wiki map is going to be amazing. Let's all do the wiki map, right? But if you really sit down and talk for a little while, you might find that maybe your group might gravitate a little bit more through into the resource wall when you think about what that project might offer as challenges. Um, they might vibe with you a little bit more. So right off the bat, try to pick a couple projects to go through the preliminary stages of your planning for. I know you got your groups yesterday. I know you've probably already started talking about what you want to do, right? But still, try to go through these like formal steps that I'm going to take you through with more than one. That sound okay? All right, look at that. We're two slides in already. Right. Um, where do I start? Where where do I start? Well, um, let me start with. Data, yes, data. Does anyone find that when you say the word, like, I can't, I can't say data without getting this greed? Hmm, data, yeah. Hmm, you got any, you got any data? Um, I was talking to someone a while ago, and um, they were like, you know, data is the new oil, uh, and I'm like, get out of my house. Uh, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> data is everything. Data is kind of the biggest thing right now. Uh, what does data mean? And how does data relate to our midterm project? So data is everything in context of a web application. Most useful web applications that you tend to use on a day-to-day -day basis in one way or another interact with data, right? Whether that's about presenting data to you, whether that's about making data accessible to you to change, whether that's about showing you data that helps you make decisions, right? In one way, shape, or form, data is integral to a web application. Um, I like to think of web apps as like windows into data, right? We don't need a UI. A UI is nice. But at the end of the day, it's about like what is the data and what can we really do with it, right? And hopefully, our UI and our web app expedites that process. So, as we're starting on our projects, and this isn't just going to be a midterm project thing, but like any time you start working on, a, on your own kind of personal project, maybe you want to launch a product um, that happens to be a web app, I encourage you to think about what is the data that you can access or acquire in the context of this project. Um, so I'm going to, for, um, as an example uh, in some of these slides, talk about a hypothetical project. And this hypothetical project is going to be uh, an application that allows me and my friends to decide on a movie we want to see. Right? Um, and the way that this application is going to do this is we're going to be able to say where we are, or maybe it'll just see our location. Uh, we'll be able to say what kind of movies we like. And then maybe this application is going to find a movie playing in a theater that's somewhere in like the geographic center between all our friends. Right? Uh, that's like a high-rated movie that matches our like things that we like. Right? So that's like an idea for a project that I'm kind of hypothesizing right now. And I might ask myself, what is the data that I can access or acquire in the context of that product? Right? I can access the data about the people using the application. Right? I can say, okay, they are in the center of the city, or they're in this other lat long. Um, the other data that I might be able to access are what movies are playing at the moment. Right? So I might have to take a look into seeing how do I actually acquire that data. Right? Is there an API that I can access? Do I have to just by hand go through magazines and newspapers and put them into my database? Like, What am I going to have to do to acquire that? For the context of your midterm project, and honestly to some degree your final project, the data that you can access or acquire um, you're going to fall into two buckets. Uh, sometimes you'll find APIs that are going to allow you to use particular data. Right? And in other situations, I think it's OK for your midterm to like hard code some data. Right? That's OK. Right? But maybe as you go forward, think about how to access this kind of data uh, dynamically. Um, the more important bit to me is this third point. In fact, I'm going to skip right over this, this second point. 
to the moment. When we have a web application, if I say that a web app is a window into data, okay, a window into data, if I take a look at, for example, Facebook, am I signed into Facebook? Do I want to sign into Facebook? Oh, no, I am. Kevin Panicia, right? So this is my friend Kevin Panicia. Kevin actually took a uh, boot camp, oh man, back in last year, May, May of last year. Um, so Kevin Panicia with this cat here, Kevin happens to be some data. Um, he happens to be some data that I can access through Facebook. And Facebook has uh, pivoted this data to add value to me by making it easy to access the images and the status updates and uh, the news that's maybe most relevant to me. Right? I have so many friends. I've got like 12 friends on Facebook. Um, and I don't need to see all that stuff all at once. So Facebook has figured out how to pivot data to add value to only show me the stuff that it thinks matters to me. Right? Does that sound OK as an example of what pivoting means in this scenario? Right? If I go to like Wikipedia, you know, Wikipedia has a ton of data. Right? And it doesn't just lay it all out all at once. Instead, I can start off by like one page that seems interesting to me. And in order to find other data, I can find information that's related to a, a particular article that I'm already reading. Right? Um, so we're looking at like interesting ways to connect that data to users, give them value. So maybe a user is trying to find information, or maybe a user is trying to like make a decision. Right? Um, give them value in an easy way. Right? And the more we start thinking about the data that we have and the way that we want users to be able to access it, the more that takes us into a conversation about features. And I'm going to draw a bit of a distinction between just straight up features and features that are benefits. Right? So as you're thinking about what you want to do with your project, right, what you're going to start doing is writing this stuff down. Right? And saying, OK, well, maybe someone who uses this app can do this, and also this, and also this. And maybe our app also uh, tracks their location and also tracks how happy they are. And it also tells them uh, how many movies Nicolas Cage has been in this year, and yada, 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 yada. Right? Um, the more we kind of add to a project, the more we have to build. Some of the things that we come up with for our project or our product to do, right, some of those things are actually going to be core and kind of central to the idea of what this project is for. Right? For example, if I take a look at uh, Wikipedia, and, um, I really like Wikipedia as a product. Like It's got a ton of stuff. I don't very often take a look at the random article thing. Right? I don't very often take a look at that. It's a feature. It exists. But it's not necessarily a benefit to me as a user uh, when I think about like what Wikipedia is technically for. Right? So if we were to make a list of all the things that Wikipedia can do, this would probably make its way all the way down to the bottom of the benefits that Wikipedia offers. Right? It's still probably good as I'm drafting up what I want to build to put this stuff on a list. Right? But I'm going to want to go through and maybe take a look at the features that I've written down and identify which ones are core benefits, which ones really make my app tick, which ones are the things that when people look at my app go, oh, I get it. Like That's why you built this thing. Right? And this is not necessarily science. This is uh, Nima's hierarchy of universal values. Uh, do with it what you will. Um, People want four things. Uh, people want to look good. People want to feel good. People want to save time. And people want to save money. These are fairly straightforward. But if you take a look at the features that you've drafted up for your project, right, and you're able to tie those features to a particular motivation, you'll have a good time filtering out the stuff that is kind of extra. Right? You'll have a good time tightening your project to like some core set of features, people go look at it and say, OK, well, I don't really understand. Or, or where people don't look at it and say, like, I don't understand why you did that particular thing. Right? Um, we'll come up with some kind of examples for these. Uh, people wanting to look good. Um, I don't use Instagram, but I do know that Instagram happens to be a fairly popular website. Uh, Instagram does a couple things. Uh, one of the things that it does is it gives you uh, little filters so you can make yourself physically look good to people. Um, 
Another thing that maybe a web, uh, an application like Instagram is good for is that it makes you look good to other people in like a class sense. Like, ooh, look at me. I've got pop tarts with whipped cream on them. <laughs> um, making me look good to other people. And it's very easy for you know, someone to take a look at Instagram, maybe scroll through a little bit and say, OK, like, how do these features make someone look good? Oh, well, the uh, number of followers that someone has, that makes them look good to someone else. right? Or that little uh, check mark that you get when you're verified on certain like, social media things. right? Like, that makes someone look good to everyone else. Um, feel good. Uh, people want to feel nice. I go on websites and look at pictures of dogs. Makes me feel good. Straightforward. If your application is all about making people feel good, right? then you can target all of your features towards that thing. And you say, OK, well, maybe I'll take a look at, um, we'll go with Wikipedia again, uh, just as an example. Like, does the, uh, does the fact that I can, for example, uh, view the, the uh, maybe that's not a good one. Has anyone ever gone to the talk page of a Wikipedia article before? Did you, did you even know that the talk page was a thing? Yo, get absolutely torqued. Check this out. Um, we're going to look out hot air balloons. Um, for, for Vancouver, this isn't necessarily as relevant for Victoria, but for Vancouver, when you see the, you know the mentor Andy? Actually, Andy has lectured for y'all before anyways, right? Uh, ask Andy about hot air balloons. Um, and specifically, ask Andy about blimp guy. Um, so if you're on the Wikipedia page for hot air balloons and you go to the talk page, uh, there is a lot of conversation around, <laughs> around stuff. And they're like, uh, I've I read this article because I was curious how much hot air one needs to lift things. But even reading quite casually, I immediately noticed basic problems with some of the numbers. Right? Like people take this stuff really seriously, which is good. Um, uh, there is some erroneous info here, but it, it makes a great <laughs> Just, I love it. Uh, anyways, there's a dude named Blimp Guy. Um, Blimp Guy here who takes this stuff very seriously. Very seriously. And you follow, if you follow like Blimp Guy, um, Dan Nakbar, uh, current experimental airship designer. Uh, this dude, he is the inventor of the personal blimp. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I'm pretty sure in Slack there's a Blimp Guy like emoji that we put in. Uh, so yeah, anyways, the reason I came uh, around to this is that this is not the point of Wikipedia, right? <laughs> this, is, this is totally, it's neat, right? But Wikipedia, for most people, is not a place where you go discuss things. It's a place where you go learn things, right? So maybe it's a good thing that they've hidden the talk page, right? And you could technically even remove it, and most users wouldn't notice. I right? um, feel like I got a little bit off tangent here, right? Be, we, do we kind of get the point of what I'm trying to talk about here? Right? Um, we'll come back to these universal values ideas as we kind of go a little bit further. Um, the basic thing is have an honest kind of dialogue with your group members about the things that might be possible to do with your application. Right? And it's very good, I think, early on to just go unchained and just go all, all these ideas. Let's write them down. Right? Write down absolutely everything. There's no bad answers. Right? And then as a group, you go through and you say, OK, well, which ones of these do we really care about? Right? Sure, this idea is cool, right? but does it actually serve like, an important purpose in the context of why our app exists? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for Victoria, the question here was, uh, they're thinking about the like button on Facebook, uh, which originally was not an essential feature, but over time has become more and more kind of essential and integral to the experience of Facebook. Right? And what's kind of like the evolution of changing features into being more central? Right? That's an ongoing kind of conversation, I guess. You know, something like Facebook is a gigantic product uh, with a gigantic user base and a really long lifespan. Right? Uh, the world has changed a lot since Facebook started, and, and Facebook has been able to kind of morph itself according to uh, sort of like social pressures and changing like tech, 
Um, the context of you know your application, I would go with like what is needed just like at this moment, right? Um, there we're looking like in in that context we're looking at like an evolving project. Uh, we can imagine for the context of the midterm that this is a static thing in like one point in time, right? Um, and you know like if I was to bring it back to my example of uh, the finding the movies with my friends, um, it might be a cool idea for me to say like, oh, you know what would be neat is if it sends you notifications whenever there's a new Nicolas Cage movie, right? Or if it shows you analytics on like uh, how often you go see movies with these particular friends, right? Um, those are all cool ideas. But they don't fit the central narrative that I'm trying to fit of the problem is I just want to find a movie to watch with my friends, right? So. I'll say that for the midterm and for like small project, uh, framing your project around one question and being able to answer just that one question. Like, how do I make somebody save money when they're trying to just transit to work? Right? Like, that's one tight central question. And I make sure that all my features that I pick are just centered around that. Um, what is really going to help you in the process of working on these midterm projects, uh, remember this slide is user stories, right? Right? Can, can everyone just say user stories with me? User, user stories. stories. All right, uh, I'll pick random people. Uh, well, user stories. No. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> user stories. I, I want you to close your eyes and just really, like, the only thing you should see, erase, erase your friends, right? <laughs> Get rid of that user stories. That is your main, your main kind of central tenet here when you're working on a project is your user stories. You're not, not even close to ready to code at this stage in your project. You should not have written a single line of code. Okay? Stop it. Who wrote code yesterday? Anyone? Oh my, get out of here. You're going home. No, it's, it's all right. Um, it's fine. Whatever. Just try not to for the moment. You know, for the rest of the day maybe. Don't like actually write any code. To work more on planning. We're going to be working on our user stories. And our user stories are going to be central to the way that we actually build our project. And it's kind of interesting to see um, the consequences that having bad user stories can have in a project. And also the benefits that having really good user stories can have in building a successful tight kind of MVP. Right? Um, here is a basic structure for a user story. Um, as a blank. I want to blank because blank. That's it. That's it. That's, that's everything. So I might say, OK, as a person with friends, I want to uh, figure out how to, you know, like what movie to go see with my friends because I want to spend time with them. Right? Um, as a person who commutes to work, I want to find the shortest and quickest path to get to work because I hate commuting. Right? Um, those are simple user stories. You can write these down pretty quickly. Notice they're not technical, right? They're not necessarily um, immediately things that I want to be able to do, but they're more like motivations. Right? Um, we can uh, have a little bit of a, of a change to our user stories. Here's a bit of a variant. As a blank, I should be able to blank because blank, right? So as a um, person who wants to watch movies with my friends, I should be able to find a movie that is in a central location for all of us um, because I don't want to uh, make my friends travel more than other friends. Okay? Um, again, not a question of how do I technically do this, right? but more a question of like what is the problem that I'm trying to solve. Right? Because then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the things that we're actually doing with our applications and we see whether we actually hit those user stories. Did we solve those users' problems? If we don't formalize this process, if we don't write this down, you will find that over the course of working on a project, your, your project ship will like steer ever so slightly in the wrong direction, right? just ever so slightly. And then when you take yourself back and you say, OK, like, did we actually do what we intended to do, you'll realize you built a very cool product that doesn't do any of the stuff you'd intended to do in the first place. Right? Um, User stories are 
uh, sort of loosely related to user scenarios. Uh, user scenarios are going to be more uh, technical and more explicit ways of describing how a user achieves a particular user story. Right? Um, I want to be very upfront. The way that I'm laying this stuff out right now right, is not the only way of laying out a project. If you go online, you'll find different descriptions for what a user story is. Right? Everyone's got their kind of like different idea. What I will say is that for a small project, right, for a small short running project, thinking about user stories and user scenarios in this way is going to help you a lot. Right? So a user scenario follows, in our case, the template of given blank, uh, when blank, uh, then blank. So for example, let me think of, a, a, again, a, an example with my hypothetical app. Um, Given that I have uh, filled out what my favorite kinds of movies are and shared a link or maybe added my friends to this thing, um, when I press the button to find a movie that we should watch, then it should tell me what movie, where, and when we should watch it. Right? And that's a more uh, prescriptive way of achieving the user stories that I've laid out. Right? Notice it is very cheap to develop these, like the user stories. And to a degree, it's also very cheap to develop these user scenarios in a conversation. Right? And this should be a collaborative effort. Often what I end up seeing is that in a group of you know, three, for example, one person might be delegated to just thinking about this stuff. Well, the other two people say, like, oh, I'm going to go do some research into how to do uh, different things with Express or different things with SQL or whatever, right? Or working with APIs. Um, but the problem is that if you delegate only one person to thinking about what the project should do, then we only have one person's view on what this project should be, right? And the other people won't have been part of the conversation. And by the time that they have opinions on what the project should do, it's already kind of late because we've started getting going on the sprint. And, um, you are in this scenario here working on a project that has one sprint. Right? It is, you know, like when you go work somewhere, your project is going to have multiple sprints. Like they're going to they're going to last quite a while, so maybe there'll be opportunities to kind of change the course. Right? But right now, it's really important to me that pretty early on we get ourselves set on what it is that our project should do. Right? So you pick a couple project ideas, you sit down, you draft up some user stories, you draft up some user scenarios. Right? You draft up maybe even more than you need to. Right? I always go by the over kind of brainstorm and then cut down. Right? Over brainstorm, cut down, you do that iteratively and you end up with some pretty great ideas. Right? You're, you're all like really creative people. Um, don't want to like limit yourself to just the first ideas that come to mind. If you need a bit of a skeleton right, uh, to give yourself uh, some guidance as you're coming up with this stuff. Um, here is an example. In this example here on the slide, uh, the hypothetical application that is being built is a, a web app that shows you short stories that people have written, you know, fan fiction or whatever, right? Um, Harry Potter and whatever. Um, I give my user story a title for the particular feature that I'm willing to like implement. Um, a user should be able to save a short story. Right? Um, so that's the title. And right off the bat, I understand what this is kind of for. And if somebody wants to see a little bit more, then they can dive into the traditional user story. So as a user, I want to save a story I'm reading because I found it useful. Right? And again, it is really important to me that you see that the traditional user story here does not have anything to do with how this is implemented. It does not have anything to do with uh, technically, what is the user doing in order to save the story? This is just a motivation. Right? And then I take a look at the scenario, which describes the, the actual interaction. Uh, given that I'm reading a short story, when I tap the icon to save the story, then save it to my saved stories. Right? And then you as a group can decide, OK, maybe we all agree on the uh, motivation or on the particular thing that we want to be achieved by a user. But maybe we don't agree on the uh, method that the user actually goes through uh, interaction-wise. Right? Maybe you don't agree, and then you can discuss on that aspect on its own. Um, and the scenario might have some additional information. For example, 
uh, talking about an icon, and then you can write for yourself, this is like a bookmark icon. And, and then you might also have uh, like a short little sketch of what this might look like. Right? And there we're getting into a conversation a little bit about wireframes, which we will have in a minute. I want to take just a, just, just pump the brakes right here. <laughs> um, not, not like a screech, but more like a rolling stop. Um, is this all right? Does this make sense to everyone? I feel like, uh, I think I've said this before to your cohort, like a conspiracy theorist sometimes, or like a doomsday person. I'll wear my little tinfoil hat. And when you see people, on, like those conspiracy people on YouTube, they're like, oh, the world's going to end. You have no idea how bad it's going to be. I'm just more like, you have no idea how OK you're going to be. Oh, things are going to be so OK. <laughs> uh, no one ever listens to me. Um, things are going to be great, as long as you do your due diligence in planning this stuff out. And I really want to fixate on this point here is that this should be a collaborative effort. Right? The midterm is your opportunity to explore what it's like to build a full project without guidance. Right? Training wheels are off. Right? Not that you ever really had training wheels. Boot camp's pretty hard. But like, um, there's, there's no real guidance here. With the projects, we give you a little bit of a prompt. Right? But you're very much open to make that project your own, right? within limits, of course. And I would like you to take the opportunity to uh, kind of poke the sore spots, uh, poke whatever feels a little raw for you, right? Do you feel uncomfortable with dealing with server side stuff? Maybe actually spend some good time on that, right? Do you feel uncomfortable doing the Ajaxy stuff with jQuery, right? Actually do that stuff, right? Try not to shy away from the things that you feel uncomfortable about. Um, because you think like, oh, the group might suffer for it. And, uh, there's a narrative that people start bubbling up within themselves sometimes, which is you want the project to succeed, so I'll just do the things that I'm good at. Right? Here's a hot take: you're bad at everything. Right? Like that's. <laughs> yeah. Victoria lost me. Oh no. Um, no. Uh, we lost you. Poke the sore spots. Um, Terrence uh, and the rest of Victoria, can you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me now? I'm just going to continue. Uh, la da da. The, the YouTube stream on my end is actually still going through. Oh, Emily was typing for a sec. Emily and Terrence. Yes, there. OK. Sweet. You're back now. Good stuff. Uh, Victoria, you missed me just saying that you're all bad at everything. Uh, so <laughs> What I'm trying to say here is that like, don't put the, the health or the success of your project ahead of your own education right? and uh, uh, your group's education. Right? I think it's honestly very important for you early on as a group to have a conversation about the things that you feel really strong in and the things that you feel like you could use some more experience in. Because then you can craft your features and your user stories and your project right, to work on that stuff. Right? Here's a hot take. No one's investing in your project. No one. Right? You're not even presenting this project publicly. Right? So, so make it about your own like, education as, as a group. Um, to kind of go a little bit deeper into that is like, if you don't do kind of your, your job in being part of that uh, ideation process, the project gets a little bit out of your own hands, or you feel like it's a little bit out of your hands. Um, you might start feeling like the tasks that you're working on right, are not the tasks that uh, you should be working on, or right? like you feel like that's. Do you, you kind of get what I'm trying to say? I, I might not have the words exactly for it. Make it a collaborative process. Um, we'll kind of get back to that a little bit more as we go forward. Uh, Alan says, "Shots fired." Pow, pow, pow. Um, we're trying to hit a place um, with your project that is uh, quote unquote feature complete. Right? And what feature complete means is that there aren't any kind of hanging edges, any, any little tendrils sticking out of your project. Somebody looks at it and says, OK, like, uh, what about that button? Like, what does that button do? And you say, oh, I didn't actually implement it. Okay? Oh, no. <laughs> right. um, we want to keep a very tight scope to our project, and we're trying to hit uh, it's something that we'll call a minimum viable product. Right? 
No one's going to look at your project and ask about very, very edge cases. Right? We want to see general kind of swaths. Right? So when you have basically like a list of maybe features that you want to implement, it's uh, valuable for you to go through and think about uh, which ones are actually worth it. Right? So I used the word aha earlier. And we're going to explore a little bit more of what that aha moment is. This is a house. Um, it's a, a manor, even, if you will. Um, has anyone seen this manor before? Yes. Oh, obviously, oh, you have. What's the? What's the? It is. It is the Winchester Manor. Yes, uh, the Winchester Manor of uh, Winchester rifle fame. Rifle? It's a rifle, right? I don't know my firearms. <laughs> uh, Nerf. Um, so. It's not the same. <laughs> so the Winchester Manor here um, was built over a series of years, uh, decades even. Uh, a fairly interesting story to look into. I don't have my notes with me, so I'm going to mess this story up. Let's imagine that everything I tell you is correct. Um, the Winchester Manor uh, was owned by a person named uh, Beauregard, Win I don't know, it was like Madame Winchester. Sarah Winchester. Um, so Sarah Winchester uh, had a bunch of kind of contacts with uh, psychics and was very into uh, the mysterious and the, uh, you know, that whole thing. Long story short, this ma uh, manor had uh, features added to it over time um, to confuse the spirits that lived within. Um, and to uh, you know, have them get lost so that the manor wasn't as, uh, I guess, it, it was thought to be infested by spirits and stuff. Um, one way to kind of look at this right, might be that this manor was built over a long period of time um, by a series of different contractors um, with different specifications and different motivations. Um, so they're saying, OK, right. Um, you know what we should totally do? Or you know what's really cool? Spiral staircases. Hmm, I like, I like spiral staircases. Where should the staircase go? Eh, you just have it go into a wall. We'll figure it out later. Um, oh, you know what I really like? Doors. What should this door point into? How about another door? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it's basically a, a manor built up out of a lot of that. Just windows that point to walls. Hallways that don't really go anywhere, um, you know, rooms that have way too many exits and stuff like that. And what we're having kind of a, a lean into is that, like, it's very possible for your projects to turn into Winchester Man, right? If you don't scope out your stuff correctly at the beginning. Um, part of what lends itself to uh, people building projects that turn into sort of a big all that mess of spaghetti is you come up with too many features, and these features aren't like fleshed out enough as ideas. It, um, it's just a, a natural kind of thing. If you have too much stuff, you can't really do like your due diligence in all of them, and you'll just kind of half effort them. Um, so I go by this heuristic: uh, if you're not going to demo it, don't build it. Just, just that if you're not going to show it to people, don't waste your time with it. Right? Let's start with number one here. Uh, as for some examples. Uh, frequently asked questions and about pages for projects. Fun fact. No one's ever seen your project before. There's, there are no frequently asked questions. <laughs> right? Also, like, what are you going to do Like in the middle of your project? Uh, let me just go to the about page, scroll through our bios. Like, uh, it's it's if it's nice to write that stuff, right? But in the context of your project right now, maybe don't spend your time on that. You do that after after boot camp, right? When you really want to like polish this and put it up online or whatever, like that's cool. Right? But in the context of your project, you might cut that stuff out. Sign up pages. Here's another hot take: No one's signing up for your app. The, like zero people, 
zero real people at demo are going to sign up for your app. Unless your project is all about the most uh, fleshed out, intense uh, sign up experience, right? If that's your project, if you're like, this is the best onboarding experience ever. Like as soon as you click sign up, our CEO shows up to your door <laughs> and you know, like if, if that's what it is, then sure, like put your effort into that, but realize that that's what your project is, right? But if your project is not about that, don't even put in a sign up page. Here's just as if I haven't spewed enough hot takes. Here's a, the, the hottest of the takes, login pages, right? We don't care if you can make login or not right, for, your final, for your midterm project, and honestly, for your final project as well. You have done login before. You did it for Tiny App. Do you remember how fun that was? So much fun. Woo. Um, cool, you did it. We don't need to see it again, right? Um, if you want to have some, like, again, if login is part of your functionality, if, like, Facebook login or you know, Google login, where you actually use the data from an external service uh, to fill out your application. If that's part of it, by all means, go ahead and do it. Right? But if you just need to be able to like, log in as a user, here's the login route. You're going to get the slides. Copy this code into your Express server. What does this do? When somebody makes a get request to slash login slash and then a name, it logs them in as that name. Right, that's it. No, no, like, you know, need to have passwords and vcrypt and whatever. We don't need it. Right? This is fine. Honestly, you know what's great for demo is if on your page you have two buttons: one that logs you in as one user and another one that logs you in as a different user. Right? That way, when you're demoing, you don't have to be like, "What was your password again?" And then it's like, "Oh, right, we went for the super secure 16 character passwords with like." Three special characters and a lyric from you know whatever like that's you know you don't need that so obviously don't ever do this in production but my recommendation is uh, cut login out just toss this in there okay. um, does anyone want to fight back against this cool all right <laughs> nice um, all right we're uh, we're going to talk about erds now. Erds. So you have started playing around with uh, entity relationship diagrams this week. Do you enjoy doing that stuff? Yeah, it's a good time. It's very nice. And from chatting with some of you, some of you even started doing some ERD stuff yesterday. Right? So ERDs are imperative to succeeding in, uh, in a project because what we're really going to be doing here is understanding the relationship between all the data that we have in our application. And this is a place where we can start exploring and asking questions about whether uh, the way that we're envisioning our application uh, actually coincides or like intersects and fulfills our um, user story. And so here's an example ERD. Uh, with this ERD, this is an application that has uh, users. Users can have many posts. Um, Posts can have many comments, and comments can be posted by users. Me. Right. So if I take a look then at my user stories right, for this particular project, I might ask, OK, a user should be able to post many times. Uh, a user should be able to comment on many different posts. And I take a look at the ERD, and I take myself through that to see if that stuff is actually possible. Right. You actually even have to make your database. right? So might as well go through this step instead of like coding it up right off the bat. In order to help you out with making your ERDs, you can follow the following rules. Um, tables are going to be your nouns. Right? Nouns being things like uh, users, posts, right? comments. Those are nouns. Generally, in ERDs, we'll write them as plural. Um, your table names, generally plural. That's the convention. So your tables are going to be nouns. And where do those nouns come from? All right, quick, uh, vote on your phones. All right, the results are in. Uh, where do the nouns come from? Huh? No, where, where do the nouns come from? 
All right, where, where do the nouns come from? Uh, close, close your eyes. Where there used to be images of your family and friends, what two words appear? Bah, 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 bah. We got user stories. What? Oh man! What? I'm back. It was me the whole time. There's user stories. User stories are going to be where you get your ERDs, right? People try too hard to build ERDs without looking at the user stories. This stuff is easy. This stuff is so easy if you have user stories, right? Trying to make ERDs without user stories is the roughest thing, right? Like not like I can't do it. I need to do that preliminary step, and then as I go through my um, through my process of building up the ERD, I generally have to keep referring back to the user story to see what it is that I'm even trying to build. Okay. Fair? Cool. I mean, nouns in the user story. Okay. Tech choices. This is a big choice. Um, when you get to start a project, to sit down and say, okay, like, how am I going to build this? Right? There's so much technology out there. Right? We got Express. We got Express. <laughs> we got Rule of Threes Express. Um, all right, so for your midterm project, you can just build it in Express. Right, that's it. Um, I would urge you to think about um, trying to build your project with uh, Ajax in mind. Right? Uh, you have now built two different projects. Right? You've built TinyApp and you've built Tweeter. They're very similar projects in a sense of uh, I'm creating data, I'm getting data. Right? Um, with TinyApp, you could even delete data and edit that data. Right? TinyApp had a multi-page kind of structure to it, right? What you had there was uh, EJS kind of like templates. Twitter did not, right? So the back end for TinyApp served views, right, or pages, whereas the back end for TinyApp had more of a role of an API, right, where an API serves back data, right? You send and receive data. You can build your project with either of these philosophies in mind. Like you can either build it as a multi-page thing, or you can build it as a uh, Ajaxy kind of application. You can even build it as a hybrid of both. That's cool. But I do want you to early on have a conversation with your group about what you kind of want to focus on. And here's the thing: if what I'm talking about right now confuses you, right? If you're having trouble understanding the difference between what happened with Twitter and with TinyApp, then that's actually the place right now where you grab a mentor, right? And you sit down and talk about that stuff, right? And that's the place where you talk with your teammates, because maybe your teammates also are having trouble grasping that idea, right? Uh, and it, it would do you like a good service to, to actually talk to a mentor about that. Does that sound okay? Uh, same thing goes with you, Victoria. Like grab a mentor, sit down and think about like whether you want to do this as, uh, like, as an Ajaxy thing or as a multi-page thing. Um, as you're having this conversation, it's important also early on to set some expectations about what you want to do for deployment. Um, people really like uh, putting stuff online. Um, it's a valuable skill to uh, play around with. Um, how am I going to put this up somewhere where it's publicly accessible? Um, I will say that deployment is not extremely difficult at all. But it is the kind of thing that you want to get out of the way early. Right? The reason I say that is because it can be a bit of a pain to take a project that already exists and deploy it, as opposed to building a blank project, deploying that, and then making sure that every change you make is deployable. Right? Um, this is something that, you know, like me just saying this doesn't really mean much. You kind of just have to experience it. But I will say that. Uh, you can make some time early on, like today, maybe early tomorrow, to talk with your team members about whether or not you care about putting your application up online. Victoria's down again. Oh, man, the internet. Um, thanks, Fabio. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, let me know when it's.
back up. So we'll just we'll just hang tight until uh, someone. Do you all want to break into song or something? Just have to con like constant audio and video go. No. Um. Ready for my solo? You know I am painfully tone deaf. Uh, I have I have one one really bad uh, on stage experience. Single one. Um, I have to say I've been very lucky. Uh, I'm tall, uh, <laughs> smart, smart handsome, uh, wealthy. No, <laughs> no. I, I, I like I've I've had like okay or like really good on stage experiences doing like like whatever is but the one really bad one I had was a talent show in high school um, I had some friends who had a band and then I had some other friends who didn't have a band and they also they wanted a band so they formed a band and they needed a vocalist and they said hey Nima you don't know anything instrument wise I knew the tuba um, I could play the tuba but they're like come be the vocalist and they picked I can rap, like that's about it. I can do like one note. Um, but they picked a couple really difficult songs and to this day I stay up at night thinking about that horrible performance and uh, oh man, it's just coming back. No, okay, so so you have two options for deployment. Uh, Heroku is one. If it interests you as a group, sit down, do a tutorial. Heroku's not that bad, right? Heroku does have uh, a starter kit for express projects, right? So play around with the starter kit. If that's something that interests you, but do not leave it until like the day before your presentations, right? Don't leave it for like four days into your project. Just do it really early on, or don't do it at all. Right? Um, the other option for deploying is just localhost 3000, right? You can de you can sh like plug in and just run it and show it on your screen. That's perfect. That's totally fine, right? Another thing is that if you run it on localhost 3000, you can actually make your application accessible to other people in the network. Right, so I don't know if I've done this for your cohort before, but sometimes when I run demos, I make them interactive so that like students can actually go to my IP address and see it, right? and add stuff and change it. But the thing is, it only works within the network, right? Unless you do special stuff. Um, but in terms of a demo, like that's fine. Right? So if you want to do that, just come talk to me or talk to another mentor or instructor about how to do that. Right? So those are our two options for deployment. Are there questions about this at the moment? Yes. Yeah, so uh, when you deploy to like Heroku, um, are you not deploying like as you go to the remote like to like Victoria? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So for Victoria, the question was, uh, when we deploy to Heroku, can I explain how you might do like a remote SQL database? That's uh, that's great. Um, basically, what happens is your um, your applications, right? As you've been building them now, like you put in a URL to where your database server is, right? And that database server might live locally, right? Or it might live on another machine, right? As you've been working on your stuff this week, your database server is on your machine, right? But you could very simply just change the URL to uh, a, a friend's machine where Postgres is running there. Actually, that might be something interesting for you to try out that uh, when you get some time is maybe go to one of the exercises that you did this week, change the URL to like, one of your peers' IP addresses and see if you can access their database. <laughs> right? that, that could be kind of fun. Yep? Right, so, so just, to, just to finish the thought on the database stuff, uh, I'll follow up on that question in a second. Um, when you deploy to Heroku, what you can do is you make that part that points to a database an environment variable. Right? Meaning that when you use your project on your computer, it points to your local database. But when you put it up on Heroku, you can configure it so that it points to Heroku's free um, Postgres service. Right? So Heroku has a, a Postgres service, and for like small projects, it's free. Right? So, so you, you can 100% have that work. Um, if you follow the... Um, Again, the, the starter, I'm pretty sure they have that set up already, um, or they have like a note to how to set that up. In terms of cost on Heroku, Heroku is free for small projects. Right? Um, so that's, that's kind of my answer to that. They, like, 
they have these uh, free dinos. I don't think you even need to put in a, a credit card at all to do this. Um, and then say you wanted to actually host something that was like scalable, then you'd have to start paying. But in terms of like putting stuff up for your portfolio, Heroku's free. You can just throw it up on there. Right? Um, does, does that kind of answer both those questions? Yeah? Yeah, cool. And none from, none from Victoria. So what time is it? Is it 11? It is 11. Well, right. I, I kind of made this joke already in terms of server framework. You only have one choice, right? Node.js with Express. Right? That's the one choice that you have for your midterm. But I do encourage you after your midterm to start thinking about what other kind of options are there. Because your, for your final project, you can choose anything. You can choose Express. Some people choose Rails, because you learn Rails at the end of your uh, program. I have seen people use uh, Python before for their backends. Um, I really, really want to see someone use uh, Haskell. <laughs> so there is the Yesod framework for Haskell, the Yesod web framework. Let's see, is there a Yesod hello world? I, I still don't understand this. So this is the hello world for, for Yesod. So I don't know. Start thinking about maybe what you want to try <laughs> in the future. Um, you have plenty of time, but for your midterm project right now, literally just Node.js and Express. Um, do not forget about NPM, right? Do not forget about NPM because you can do fantastic stuff with NPM. Right? Bring in all kinds of modules um, that, you know, maybe there's modules for interacting with particular APIs, right? Like maybe you're dealing with the Google Maps API, right? I just always Google stuff and then NPM, right? And I will find, oh, there's a Google Maps NPM library for Node.js, right? And I could explore, like, what does this actually do, right? So, so don't forget that you can leverage the work that other people have done. I think what we'll do now is we will take a break, right? I'll give you a, let's do, let's do 12 minutes. All right, we'll give you 12 minutes, treat yourself. Um, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about routes, and we're going to go through the mechanics of actually setting up your project. Sound good? Cool.
Um, all right, you. What's up, uh, Victoria? Um, if you could just let me know when the audio and the video is working again. Oh, no problem, parents. <laughs> uh, glad you all like the cats. Uh, this here cat that we're seeing is uh, Maru. Maru the cat. Um, Maru loves boxes, and uh, yeah, just. I mean, look at that. <laughs> Athleticism. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> of his little feet, like, popping up. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's Maru the cat, which I, I will share in the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Victoria wants to see Maru's slide. Oh, yeah, actually, let's do that. Maru slide. Oh, there's a slide in Maru. I haven't seen this before. Right, just just because uh, I'm just going to skip forward a little bit. <laughs> there you go. And then and then there's a second cat too. Um, so yeah, this is Maru, and I I love Maru. I would I would trade anything for just to meet Maru, honestly. Um, yeah, there's there's just so much, uh, so much Maru. All right, um, whew, just a little. So we were uh, taking a look at uh, how to build our midterm projects, and we got to this one part where I said let's just take a break and we'll come back. Um, we're gonna get a little bit more into um, the mechanics of actually setting up our project. Um, this one part that I want us to focus on now is setting up your routes. Um, at this point here, we've talked about our user stories. We've talked about our ERDs. And uh, I want you to know that neither of these things and neither of the steps that I'm going to like, continue talking about are like static. They're not like fixed. Meaning that it's not like you do your ERDs and you say, I'm never doing it again. Right? Uh, this is very much a living document. You're going to find yourself looping back and forth and over and over and over again. So this is a good place to start talking about your routes once you have your user stories and your ERDs at least somewhat figured out. Um, routes being, are these going to be like get routes and post routes? Meaning, if part of my user stories are that a user should see every movie that is playing in Vancouver, right? if that's one of my user stories or scenarios, then maybe what I need is a route that receives or, or, or like gets all of the movies. Right? Uh, if somebody is able to add a thing, right? maybe that's going to be a post route. And you need to actually have this stuff written out as uh, like in a document somewhere to refer to. Because if you plan this stuff out early enough, it's going to make distributing your tasks among group members a lot easier. Right? People will already know what's kind of set up. You'll have made these decisions as a group, and then it just becomes a matter of coding it up. Um, points to kind of consider are get versus post versus put patch versus delete. Right? Have a conversation about those. Uh, are we going to have parameters in our URLs? And if we are, like, what are those parameters going to look like? Um, one way to approach making your routes is following the RESTful convention. Right? Uh, are you all familiar with what REST means? Representational state transfer, right? REST sounds complicated. I know you've explored it a, a little bit at least, but if I was to put this into, and you know what, I'll write this directly into the Victoria Slack. If I was to put this into a cheat sheet, uh, REST in a nutshell becomes uh, what is the data, right? So like, what are you dealing with? For example, cats, right? Uh, cat, like, scratch toys or whatever. Cat toys. Okay? Cats and cat toys. Okay? Maybe that's the data. And then the <laughs> following question is, what are you doing with the data? Okay? So as I look into what is the data, I have cats, cat toys, and then I might also say cats have cat toys. Right, so I have the data and some relationship between them. You can get that from your ERDs that you already made at this point. And then what am I doing with the data? Those might be things like um, I, can, I can create a cat in my 
like database. Um, I can give a toy to a cat. Right? Uh, a cat can destroy a toy. Right? Those are things that might happen to the data. And then with those two questions in mind, REST tells us that we can define the data by going cats to get all the cats, cats slash ID to get a single cat. And then if I wanted the toys for one cat, it would be cats slash ID slash uh, maybe toys. Okay, that's what REST says. And, uh, what if I wanted to get a particular toy for a particular cat? What might I do? Right. If I wanted to get a particular toy for a particular cat, I might go cats, ID, toys, and then toy ID. Right. That might be what I end up doing. And, and if we're talking about what we're able to do with it, then we ask ourselves questions like get is to get the data. Right. Uh, post is create new data. Right. And then honestly, we could just stick with uh, then put for edit and delete or you know, destroy or delete that data. And this is REST in a nutshell. REST is just a naming convention for your routes. If you go online, you're going to find that people make it seem a lot more complicated than it really is. Right? So that's technically REST in a nutshell. Cool? So you can sit down as a group. And again, I encourage you to make this a group activity. Right? Pretty much everything you do for your midterm project should be a group activity. Right? Because there is something for everyone to get from each one of these things. And um, again, sometimes I see people say, oh, this person here is on the routes, right? But then you're doing a disservice to yourself by like, not letting yourself be a part of that process. If the uh, table names are the nouns, right? Like they come from the nouns in your user stories, the routes are going to come from your verbs, right? Like what can I do in my user stories? Cool? Right. Again, I want you to see that all the stuff that we've done here, very cheap. If I was to time box this for you, if I was to say you have 15 minutes, right, and I gave you a project prompt, you should honestly be able to get to this point in 15 minutes. It won't be great, right, but some hacky kind of version of a prototype of an idea, right, you can get to. You like skipping the deployment conversation and the tech stack conversation, but the user stories, ERDs, and routes should be able to do pretty quickly. Which is why I say pick multiple projects and practice on those iterations. Maybe there is one project that you really want to do, right? Pick two other ones that you don't really want to do as much, but practice on those, right? Practice the process on those and then switch over to the project that you really want to do and you'll be like flexed and ready for it. Right? Um, so here's a user story again. The last part um, that I honestly think that you should try and like practice uh, as much as possible is wireframing. Right? Wireframing is about translating our user stories into some sort of a visual representation. I'm not talking about design. Like I'm not talking about making really pretty things. Right? I'm talking about making stuff that allows users to actually enact the user stories. Right? So for example, if I'm saying a user should be able to um, see the movies that are playing near them, then I make a wireframe that shows how a user might be able to do that thing. Right? And this is something that you could do quickly on a whiteboard and have a conversation about. Whiteboards are nice because you can just erase things and draw more stuff. Then when you're happy with it, you take a picture of it. And maybe then you move on to making like a nice actual like high fidelity thing on your computer. Um, so the wireframe is going to have several purposes in one way they describe your layout. Like, how is the page actually going to be laid out? Are we going to have multiple pages? Or are there parts of it that change? Right? Um, one of the neat things that you kind of see by working on the um, wireframes is that you get to really explore the hierarchy of data in your application. So if I was to maybe use that example of the, um, where did I put that? The uh, cat toys. Right? Um, if I'm making a website that catalogs cats and their toys, as I'm making the wireframe, it might make sense to me to be able to see cats, and then inside of cats, I go see toy. Right? And I'm seeing this hierarchy of data actually being represented in the way that the user uses the application. Um, 
But one of the other things that's pretty important to start talking about here is how does someone interact with this stuff? Okay, interaction. So if I was talking about that prior example of the movies in the town, right, in the city, uh, one way of displaying that data is as a list. Okay? And a user is able to interact with the list by just scrolling up and down. Maybe there's a filter. Right? But another way of displaying that stuff is as a map. I can show pins on a map. And so a user is able to like, drag around and zoom and maybe tap on pins. And those are all like, interesting conversations to have. Right? About, OK, if, if we want users to be able to access this data, like, how do we want them to access it? Right. So there are good wireframes. This is a fairly good wireframe here. Uh, there are bad wireframes. The garbage wireframe. Blech. Everyone go. Sss, sss. This is bad for. <laughs> this is bad for several reasons. Um, might start off by going, okay, like, image, fine, whatever. There's going to be an image here. I kind of get the idea. Title goes here. Okay, all right, maybe this is some kind of blog or something. There's a title, uh, text, all right, some text. What the actual heckin' frick, you know? What does notifications mean? And because the more I look at this uh, rectangle that just says notifications, the more I ask myself, is this a notification bar with lots of little pop-ups? Is this like a sliding kind of ticker, like a newsreel that shows me stuff popping by? Uh, is this something that I click on, like a bar that I click on that then like <coughs> elevates itself up to display a bunch of stuff? Uh, I have no idea what this means at the moment. Right? If I was handed this by someone, I would be stuck. Right? I would be very stuck on even figuring out where to start. Not even talking about visually. Right? Obviously, this isn't a visual, it's not a mock-up. Right? Right, but it's a wireframe of hierarchy. I don't even know how to start structuring my components. Right? Um, this is a real wireframe that a grad received um, at like their job post boot camp um, like years ago. Yeah, I remember a, an instructor who worked here at the time had told me that um, the person who had hired this grad was like, "Yeah, I'm not really happy with them. Like they're not getting as much work done as I was." Is that, is that true, KV? This slide here. Don told me that this was a, a slide that a, a grad had received at a job. Yeah. So the way that Don had told me it was that like this employer had been like, yeah, this grad's not getting as much work done as I thought they were going to. And then Don took a look at like, uh, he's like, okay, like what have you been giving them? And took a look at the wireframes and was like, yeah, well, that's probably one of your problems is that you're not being very explicit about what they're supposed to be doing. And a junior or really any person is not going to be able to extrapolate out of like half baked ideas. Um, so as a group, you can get together and hash out stuff. And then you might end up with some garbage like this. <laughs> This uh, also has way too much on it. Right? This is too much, but hey, you know what? The right intentions are there. I mean, you sat down and you said, I want to be able to do all these different things. But this is a place where maybe as a group you sit and you say, OK, uh, there is just too much going on. What can we cut out of this? Right? What is really crucial for this part of the project? Um, this is an iterative process. Right? My recommendations for figuring out wireframes, right? for figuring out how to lay your projects out, is to go get some inspiration from other stuff. Right. For example, if you're working on the resource wall, the resource wall is very similar to Pinterest. Here is your wireframe. You go Pinterest uh, homepage. You go images. Holy moly, what? How easy was that? Right. I already have a bunch of ideas about how I might structure my project. Right. Um, get inspiration from other people. Right. Sound good? I should I should pin that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, does anyone have any questions at the moment? Cool. Um, I would challenge you to come up with multiple variations of, ac of, of doing the same thing. Right? Uh, often, we might sink into the very first kind of wireframe or layout idea that we come up with. Right? Uh, try to come up with, with more and more and more. Challenge yourself a little bit. Right? Really, really stress that part. Um, once you have some rudimentary wireframes, you can start taking yourself through a storyboarding process. It doesn't need to be um, super kind of like, you know, detailed or whatever, right? Just enough to give yourself an idea of how a user actually interacts with the application through the, the different screens that you've wireframed. Right? Like, okay, if I need to be able to, uh, again, find a movie to watch with my friends, 
what do I need to go through? What screens am I going to go through in order to be able to end up at the final kind of uh, answer? Right? So you can take your wireframes and just put them in a row. Or at least like write out first wire like person goes through screen one, then they go through screen four, then they go through screen seven. Right? How do we figure out how to tie these um, wireframes together to build like a cohesive experience when well, we're going to go back to our user stories, right, and imagine ourselves going through that. Um, yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. I know that this presentation takes like a while to go through, but that's because I'm, I'm spending quite a bit of time going maybe a little too much into some details. Right? But this process itself is something that you can crunch through in like 20, 30 minutes, right, at a very kind of low fidelity level. Right? Uh, there are, for example, hackathons that people go to that are all about just this process. Just putting together user stories, putting together like ERDs and wireframes, and giving like a presentation on the product that we would build, and this is how we would make it. We didn't make it, but this is how we would make it. That's a totally valid hackathon. Right? There was um, a series of events uh, called ProtoHack. Um, ProtoHack. Um, they've shut down now, but ProtoHack was uh, basically an organization that was running like prototyping hackathon events uh, across the world. Right? And it might be neat for you to go online and, and read uh, you know, old kind of posts and stuff about what ProtoHack was. I might put that into the channel as well. So that being said, uh, most people are not super happy with uh, is like wireframes is they don't really tell you much about what the application is going to look like from like a visual point of view, uh, as in like colors and fonts and whatever. You might want to spend some time thinking about design. I will be very honest with you. I'm not a designer. I don't care. <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't have the eye for it. I know that there's good design out there, and I kind of leave it to people who are better than me. Um, but I didn't make these slides. <laughs> Design matters. Yeah, this is a, ooh, ooh, wow, very chic. Very chic. Uh, and then, however, it's a little garish, though. However, um, you are developers in this boot camp. You're not designers. right? Design does matter. People will care about design when they take a look at your products, whether it's your midterm, your final project, any of your side project, when you go work somewhere. right? People will care about design. Right? So if you're working on your own and you don't have a designer on your team, it's still worth thinking about how to make your application look nice. Okay. Steal. Go online. Take a look at uh, Dribble, right? Folio Focus. Right? Do what I just did a second ago and Google other products, right? And take a look at how other people didn't just steal. It's fine. No one's going to sue you right now. Um, <laughs> for example, here is like if you were designing like a landing page for a startup, right? Is every website ever uh, we're unique. Uh, you know, this is the bit where we talk about how unique we are. These are our, we always have three columns, right? Uh, like, it, that's the design that a lot of landing pages have gone with because it works. Um, you know, I really like, well, when I say like, uh, there's this thing called Cucumber. You have now worked with Mocha, right? For testing, Mocha and Chai. Um, right, so this here, uh, Tools and techniques that elevate teams to greatness. Wow, what is this? I need this. This is essentially just another thing like Mocha, right? but they make themselves seem as if like you elevate your team to well, like look at all these people collaborating. What they're handing things over. I want to collaborate. Wow, this person's cosplaying as Steve Jobs. I love that. <laughs> right? Um, this person seems inquisitive. Right, like, but it's it's essentially just just mocha. Um, what I'm trying to say is that like by adopting a particular like design, you can kind of impart a feeling, um, and that feeling might tie back to the user stories that you're trying to achieve. Right? Um, so take a look at people who've done similar stuff to the products that you're trying to build and steal from them for now, and that's fine. So here's a slide about how important it is to uh, do development without design. 
Mmm. Let that wash over you like, like, like a wave. Uh, Do you hear that? Do you hear the wind chimes and the, the trees blowing in the wind? Just steel, steel design. Um, <laughs> pick a UI framework. Honestly, don't build this stuff from scratch. When I say steel, I don't just mean like steel ideas. Steel code, man. Like steel, <laughs> actual code. Do you know what Bootstrap is at this point? Right? Yeah. Steel. Like use Bootstrap. Use something similar. Uh, Bootstrap gives you a grid framework for building. Uh, like websites, and that helps you make like uh, building both responsive stuff and also just things that kind of look nice easier. Um, there are a ton of like CSS frameworks out there. Uh, they give you kind of pre-built things. Um, the one that you're gonna pick for midterm is gonna be Bootstrap, or that's my recommendation. Like just use the newest version of Bootstrap. Um, but there are a ton of other ones out there. Right? Uh, foundation, uh, Bootstrap, Skeleton, pure CSS. There's all this kind of stuff. For right now, just use. I would recommend Bootstrap. I have no idea what the heck Foundation Zurb is. Uh, it's on this slide, but I don't know what it is. Um, if you want to, as a group, maybe like look up the more like the most common CSS, uh, CSS frameworks out there right now. Um, you know, do so. Um, the one that tends to get you the most bang for your buck in terms of like ease of use and kind of prettiness and functionality is going to be Bootstrap. Okay? Because, for example, say that part of your thing is going to be that you want your, um, what do you call it? You want your application to have some carousel thing. So you see this thing up here that like slides like that. Uh, this is not, it's not impossible to build on your own. Like, it's really not impossible to build on your own. You could do it. It's just going to take more time than it's worth right now. And it's going to take a bit more time than it's worth. And so I might go to Bootstrap and find out how can I steal their carousel. Right? Does that sound fair? So, so take a look at the components that exist. You know what I find kind of neat is when you do the wireframing process, uh, at least for me, I get myself stuck in what I already know or what I know I can do. Right? Um, but it can help me a lot in coming up with like better ways of building things by looking at what exists out there. So if I'll do like a little bit of wireframing myself, then I'll go on, on some component libraries or some UI frameworks out there and take a look at what exists, I'll realize that, oh, there's a lot more possibility than what I thought there was. Right? And I'll go back and I'll change up my wireframes a little bit. Um, so do kind of take a look at, at Bootstrap for um, getting started on your thing. Neat. Are there any questions about this at the moment? If you do want to challenge yourself, you know, with building some some of these things completely from scratch, by all means do. But be very kind of clear with yourself that that's going to take some time, right? And talk with your teammates about whether that's a place where you want to spend your resources in, okay? Maybe we'll have to scale a little bit down on some features because we want to learn a little bit more about building our own drop-down menu or our own carousel, right? or our own, you know, map controls or whatever. Now we're getting really close to being able to start actually coding. And we're gonna talk about Git. I'm gonna leave the conversation for Git to be like pretty pretty light. Um, I want you to kind of go through a, a trial by fire, as it were, of like figuring out how to work on this stuff. Um, you have likely not encountered merge conflicts before, um, unless you've done something really weird. <laughs> Has anyone here ran into a merge conflict already? Nice, all right. I, my hope for you, my, my deep hope for you is that you all run into a merge conflict at some point. Um, and you'll learn a lot from it. Basically, what you, what's gonna happen is that you know, you're working on a project Multiple people, uh, different people are going to have different versions of the code. It's going to get out of sync. You need to figure out way, ways to have a workflow that doesn't end up in people having like completely outdated versions of code right? or completely incompatible projects. So think back to what you talked about on day one. I, I saw somebody in the Vancouver channel posted a Git cheat sheet. Right? 
Take a look through that Git cheat sheet, right? Stuff, nice. Um, take a look through that Git cheat sheet, right? And, and think about like what are the commands that you're likely going to be using. And here is a workflow that you and your team can adopt right, to avoid uh, issues, right? This isn't going to 100% like, like you're never going to have any problems, right? Because one way or another, one of you is going to make a mistake, and that's fine, right? But this is going to at least minimize the problems that you run into. Um, first thing to do is clone, obviously. So you might have made the project, maybe on so, maybe on one person's account. One person makes the repo, and adds people as collaborators, and then you can all clone. When you work on a feature, you make a branch for that feature. Right? So we'll talk about what it's like to divide tasks in a couple minutes. Right? Uh, we'll talk about what that's like. But when you have divided tasks, and maybe the two of us are working on two different things, we both make different branches off of master, and we work on that stuff. And you code, and you code, and you code, and you code. And when you are uh, ready to put this stuff into the, the main kind of master branch, right? like you have at this point, as you code on your own branch, you can commit and push and push and push and push on your own branch. Right? But when it's ready to be pushed into master, you can as a team sit down. And I would recommend doing this as a team to make sure that everything goes right. Check out to master, pull from your branch. If there are merge conflicts, you resolve them right there. You'll find out what merge conflicts are like if you run into them. Right? You make sure that your code works, and then you push. Right? And my recommendation is that you push to master as a team. Right? There is um, some flexibility in, like, in, in variations of this workflow. Right? If you look online, there's things called pull requests. I don't necessarily recommend getting too into pull requests right now. That's something that I actually do recommend for your final projects. Right? Um, if you want to, as a team, like you can go online and learn about pull requests, or maybe pull me or uh, like a mentor or someone off to the side, and we'll give you like a little bit of a breakout. Um, it is the kind of thing you kind of need to see happen. But for right now, if you follow just this, like you will be fine. Right? Uh, you'll notice that some of these have little asterisks on them. Those are places where you should test. Does this mean writing tests? And you can. You now know how to write tests for like Mocha and for your, for your functions and stuff like that. You can do that if you want. And we're not going to put that uh, requirement on you. But what you should do is test to make sure by hand, does your application do what you're still expecting it to do? And how do you figure out what your application is supposed to do? Well, you look at your user stories. Right? You look at your user stories and you take yourself through that flow. Right? Places where it's imperative to test your stuff are while you're coding on a feature. Um, when you pull into um, when you pull into your like master from your branch, and you want to make sure that the code that you've brought in hasn't broken the uh, master stream. One thing that I, I, I encourage you to try out, you might want to make a note of this, is it can take a while to do a feature. Oops. It can take a while. It might take a couple hours. It might take a couple days. Right? In the real world, like it'll, it'll probably take a couple days. And what happens while you're working on that feature is that the master that everyone's working on, people will have committed to that. So your original branch is now out of date. Like you've added some code, and it's now also out of date with what people have added. And what you can do is continuously pull from master into your own branch, right? And that's something that you can do to ensure that your branch doesn't like fall behind, right? It's not the easiest thing to do, right? And it's something that again I would recommend you ask either a peer to help you with or a mentor to help you with. Um, the best thing that you can do is try to keep your features really small so that they don't fall out of date. 
Oh, are there questions about the, the Git workflow at the moment? Yep. What I mean is uh, you're working on, like, say there's three people, right? You're working on three laptops. Um, you can work on your own independent branches, right? And when you, like, as Fabio, you're like, you know what? I'm happy with this feature, right? Instead of you choosing to put it into master, right? I would, like, just gather the other two people on the team and say, hey, I'm about to do this. Like, are we OK with it, right? And do the merge into your own local master. As a team, like, you sit down at the laptop and take a look at what's happening. You go, OK, like, yes, just a quick sign off. Right? And then when you're happy with it, you go push. Right? And it, sh it shouldn't take very long. Like just a, like a couple seconds of like looking through it um, and just signing off. Right? There's a, like, that thing that I would call a pull request. Um, that's a, an online version of that. Right? A pull request is when you do that on GitHub and you ask team members to like on GitHub look at the code. Right? But there's a bit of an involved workflow to that that I don't really want you to explore right now. I'd rather you take a look at that for your final project. Again, if you're feeling adventurous, like by all means, take a look at that. Please. Don't code directly on master. Just don't. Um, don't do it. Were you going to code directly on master? Don't. Stop. Friends don't let friends code on master. Has Nima coded on master before? Absolutely. Does Nima regret it? So much. <laughs> so much. Um, you know, you get to a place where I'm like, sometimes I just get full of it in here, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, Nima, yeah, look at, I can do anything, right? You know what I did recently? I coded on master, <laughs> and I, I ran into a, like, just a bunch of problems with, uh, oh man, just you commit bad things, and then you have to figure out how to revert your commits and. Some of those commits are good, and some of those commits are bad. How do I only get rid of the bad commit? It's not, it's not worth it. Right. Almost getting ready to code at this point, right? Like maybe as a group you've talked about, and just ensure that everyone's on board with your Git workflow. You can talk about scaffolding your application. And scaffolding means is having like just the series of steps to get it started. Right? Um, this should be done, again, as a group. Right? Sit down, one laptop. Right? If you're a group of two, two one laptop. Three, three, all around one laptop. Look at how excited these two people are. This person's like, wow, whoops. Yeah. Wow, I've never had so much fun before. I'm so glad I'm your friend, and I love pair programming. I'm, I'm so glad we listen to Nima. Yeah. Um, here's a checklist for scaffolding. Set up your GitHub repository, download and install all resources. This should be done on like one machine to start off with. Um, download and install all the resources. So npm install express. Um, you know, make sure that express is running. Um, if you're bringing in jQuery and stuff like that, make sure you're using things like those CDN links, right? Uh, as you're setting up your little like hello world express and uh, jQuery situation. Um, oh man, we're running out of juice here. Um, Make sure that your app loads after installing all this stuff. Right? This feels like a silly step for me to kind of point out, but it is important. There are so many times when I've just installed stuff and gone like, I bet it works, and committed it. And then I've had the three other people on my team being like, what the heck did you just give us? Like, none, none of this works. Um, it bit me. It will bite you, too. <laughs> um, so once that's done, then by all means, like push your app to GitHub. Make sure that everyone else in the team can clone that stuff. Right? And once they've cloned it, make sure that everybody on the team can actually run the project. Right? Let me mute for a second and plug in my uh, laptop.
I had just muted myself. Yeah, you don't need that. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks, Davey. Okay. Uh, turns out if I press mute and don't unmute, I stay muted. Um, debugging. <laughs> so dividing tasks can be done in a bunch of different ways, and it really comes down to what your goals are, um, what your goals are as a group, also what your goals are as a person taking this boot camp. Um, I have seen people over the, you know, two years that I've been here, divide tasks in front end and back end kind of roles. Um, I can honestly confidently say that I, that's my least favorite way of dividing tasks. Right? Um, you might get a lot done. You might honestly get a lot done by dividing such that like one person works on just the express stuff and one person works on just the front end stuff. Okay, just the jQuery stuff. That's, that's fine. Maybe sometimes you even have, if it's a group of three, one person working on just the database stuff. In a real work environment, yes, that is the way that things tend to be kind of split up. Right? The thing is here, you're in an education environment. Right? What we want is, in my opinion, to give you exposure to all parts of the stuff. Right? You want like a holistic experience. Right? This is not about how many features you can pack into your midterm. Right? You want to pack a lot of features into your midterm, outsource the project. Right? Like, just do that. It's cheap. Right? But for me, it's about how much you kind of learn out of this. Right? My favorite way of splitting stuff up for midterm and for final projects is by feature. Right? You take a look at all the features that you've come up with, all the user stories. Right? And these features are going to touch, for the most part, they'll touch front and back end. Right? Say, for example, there was a feature that said a user can like a post, right? like, like liking a status on Facebook. That involves some front end, the clicking and the, a little icon change in color. Right? But it also involves some back end, meaning that somewhere that post needs to be saved. I like to divide tasks that way. Right? I also like to have people pair on these. Right? You don't have to pair. Right? But I find that you get a lot of mileage in terms of like learning right? and collaboration and really exploring like things that maybe you might have shied away from when you do an honest and good job of pair programming. Right? So if you're working on like a project with three people, right? it might be good for when you divide tasks. Right? Uh, you say, okay, I'm, let's. How about the two of us are going to take on this feature, and you could take on that feature if you want. And then when we're done these features, then we split again. And uh, you know, you two can pair, and I'll take on this one. So you each get like some experience, both pairing and doing stuff on your own. Right? Um, again, I see sometimes people will like avoid the things that they think they're not going to be good at. Right? That's not what boot camp's for. Right? Boot camp is about like exposing the stuff that you don't know how to do, right? And and really just kind of diving into it. Right? Uh, the midterm project I find to be one of the most valuable parts of the boot camp, in, in an educational sense. So again, this is probably a conversation that you want to have with your teammates. It, how do we want to split this up? Honestly, maybe you'll find at the end of your conversation you really do want to go front end, back end, database, or whatever, right? Like that's cool. But if I was to put my two cents in, I would probably lean towards splitting up by features and doing things in pair. Does that sound okay to everyone? But again, it's at the end of the day, it is your choice. At this point here, you're ready to code, right? You're ready to hop in. You've done your scaffolding. You've talked about your tasks, right? And you take a look at your features and you figure out which one uh, logically makes sense to be the first, right? Um, you might even start off doing some front-end scaffolding. I totally glossed over the there you go, celebration. You might even jump into some front-end scaffolding uh, that gives you like a good kickstart, meaning you take a look at your design. You start building out the giant kind of swaths of it in broad strokes, right? With um, hard-coded data, right? So you start off with like static pages, um, put in some placeholder text, right? And you just start getting it to look like something. It doesn't have any interaction yet, but it looks like something, right? and that's one place to start. I find that that can be a really nice place to start for people because you get some immediate like visual feedback over whether you like wh what you like, whether you like what you're seeing or not. Um, if you start off with like the visual stuff, um, you know, make a decision on how you're going to be doing your CSS. 
it can be important to try out these like like your pages with different quantities of data. Big images, small images, lots of text, almost no text, right? Just to see how your uh, pages kind of uh, look according to that. Backend scaffolding is also really important. And this is going to give you a little bit of a kickoff point. Um, I would approach this project similar to how you've approached the tiny app, right? Take a look at how, how tiny app was built up. Where you start off with hard coded data objects. Like tiny app was not connected to a database, right? Start off with hard coded data objects. Make sure that each of the things that you're trying to do, um, maybe if you're trying to do like specific functions that transform some data, code them up in the REPL, right? Like play around with them in the, um, in the, uh, REPL to see if they work, right? test them out a little bit before you bring them into the app. So the most important thing that you can do is to code atomically, meaning code small, right? code with like purpose, right? use helper methods, um, and modularize. You won't necessarily have a ton of time to refactor. Right? Refactoring is a big part of the software development cycle. Right? Here you have a week. A week is actually a ton of time. Like it is a, a insane amount of time. Um, you'll find that it'll fly by really quickly, but you're going to get a lot done. That if you start or as you code with the aim of keeping your code modular, uh, you will find that your code base uh, remains fairly kind of easy to work with. Right? Uh, as soon as you start just kind of coding randomly, um, that stuff bites you back really, really quick. For, for tips on how to scaffold your backend or how to like actually structure your backend, my biggest recommendation would be to go online and take a look at how other Express projects are laid out. Okay. Take a look through the Tweeter project. Tweeter has a really interesting structure to it. Take a look through it. I believe you also get a, a, like a skeleton project to work with for your midterm. Right. Take a look through that skeleton. Spend some time really digesting the structure for them. Right. They do get a skeleton, right, Katie? Yeah. Right. So take, take some time digesting that. And ultimately, one of the kind of pivotal parts of your project is going to be how you communicate with each other. Right. Um, there's moving parts to this. How many of you have worked on a group project at some point in your life? Hey, okay. How many of you have always had fantastic experiences working in groups? Me neither, right? So this is your opportunity to take the things that you've learned from working in groups, right? Like what are the things that maybe, like I can say, for example, that there's things that I don't like that I've done working in groups, right? And that I've changed over time, right? So take a look at yourself. Take a look at, oops, take a look at the um, things that other people have done uh, that you've wanted to try before. Maybe think of some different ways of keeping on track with everyone else. Um, there's many tools that you can use, uh, Slack, Telegram, Skype, whatever. Just pick something, right? think, boop, 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 boop. communicate with each other, and let each other know what, what it is you're working on, how you're feeling, right, and how far through what you're working on you are. Right? Um, it's not a bad idea at all to have like, you know, little stand-up sessions. You know, at the beginning of the day, maybe at the end of the day, getting together and saying, okay, what is the goal for today? How am I going to approach it? What scares me? What do I feel is going to be something that blocks me uh, or is going to slow me down? Right. And chances are that, you know, as you go, I don't know how to do Ajax. Uh, one of your team members is going to be like, all right, well, let's sit down and we'll figure that out together. Right. Um, Trello is an excellent tool for keeping track of the uh, features that you're working on and like what has been like not done yet, what is in process uh, what, or in progress, what is uh, finished. You can use something like Trello for that or just post-it notes or something. Uh, but keep a document somewhere, whether it's Trello or something else, that shows where you are with your project. And, um, and many of you may have prior experience working with these kinds of tools. Take some time at the beginning of the project to share with each other um, about some of the experiences that you have. Okay. And that brings me to the uh, conclusion of this. 
I do want to once again, though, point on the, the point of the midterm is education. Right? Make sure that you feel like fulfilled with what you're doing. And if you're not, be very clear with your teammates about it. Not in like an aggressive or confrontational way, right? Not like, I, I, don't, I don't want this, the, like, this should not be you in your, why didn't you let me do any of the Postgres stuff? And it's like, I didn't, I didn't know you wanted to do any of the Postgres stuff. Well, I did, right? Like, that's, <laughs> like, that's not, I don't, I don't want that kind of situation to pop up. So just be very clear with each other. Um, one of the things that I very like, uh, very much liked uh, when I saw a group doing this last year. Actually, it's been a, it's been a long time. They um, every hour they did like a morale check, um, and they kept a running kind of like line graph on uh, the window that they were working next to. So every hour, one of them would stand up grab a little marker and go, OK, like, how are we feeling? And then they draw like another line. <laughs> um, it's just a good way to like check in with each other. Um, yeah, yeah, they take, they're like, oh, I feel it. And then they do, I think, I think what they did was they had like each of them, and then they put like one in the middle as well, um, which is pretty funny. So, so yeah, that's everything I have for you right now. Do uh, pull in mentors to get like continuous help, right, and continuous kind of input. Something that you might even want to try out is as you're coming up with the, your ideas, do some uh, user interviews. Uh, maybe pull in uh, one of your like other peers from another group and just ask them, hey, what do you think of this idea? Right? A little bit of like collaboration cross group. Right? That could work really well. Are there any questions uh, from Victoria, from Vancouver? Or are you all just fully ready to hop right into it? Do this, All right? Can I get a, just a no from someone in Victoria? Um, just, just a no, or, or tell me I exist. I, <laughs> um, I like the. I don't know if y'all saw the little Kanye. And Terrence says no. Perfect. You are free to go. We got twelve oh two. Good timing. <laughs> Alan with the the very clever no. There we go. Uh, you know I see. I, like I love this little face. Um, sweet. So have a great rest of your day. If you have any questions, just reach out to me. I'm going to make the slides available to you in like a couple minutes. Um, oh, thank you. Very nice. Wow. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great rest of the day. Bye.